Hello there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and all the other good stuff. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 139, with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? We're into the new year, man. We're, we're very much into it now. It's not the fourth, you know what I mean? You know, all warmed up and stuff. You should be all limbered, ready to roll. You should have understood what your position is, what you're doing, what you're not doing. Worked out the chinks in your armor and you're running on into the head of traffic, you know, caring not one bit for your life or the safety of other pedestrians and you're careering into that traffic lane, hoping, hoping that that somersault you practice in the back of your garden is going to work. Welcome back to the Excel Zinger Show. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's Friday morning right now. I'm recording this at a nondescript time because time is of no essence if you're listening to the video podcast time. But just know it's very early in the morning. I'm now talking to you directly from my in um, my habitable home here in the depths of Stratford somewhere. Undisclosed location for those that know that. No, 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 no. And yeah, here we are, man. Nice and fresh. I just got back from a workout in the gym today. From all that, from all that um, rabbit on, I've been doing about. Oh, I don't want to go to a gym in case all the flipping New Year's Eve resolution people are out and they're not training and they're not taking things seriously. Blah 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 blah. Remember all that crying I was doing about that, right? Well, guess what? I get to the gym, and it's fairly empty. Hardly anyone was there. It was like considerably empty, more empty than I would have um, assumed it would be empty. I didn't see any really uptake in kind of personnel there. I saw maybe the, st- I saw usually the same old faces I usually see whenever I go. And in general, it just seemed like any other day. And the day previous to that, when I went for a run in the morning, I also didn't see any other new bodies or new people um, careering down the street, jogging and trying to keep up a certain pace. All I saw was myself. All I heard was myself. Um, which was interesting, right? So all that kind of, you know, apprehension on my side, when I actually go... And witness it for myself, I realized, you know what? No one really cares as much as I'm making it seem as people care for the most part, right? Because it just takes so much work. Like for all the stuff that I speak about that, you know, is fairly motivational and it's go rah rah. If you're if you're a general, you know, average um you know, if you if you if you're an average person, part of the general population who doesn't really have any, you know, extrinsic goals or motivations that are driving you, just want to kind of get along with life, get paid, look after those who are around you, and just, you know, keep on keeping on. You're not really gonna bother doing New Year's Eve resolutions, are you? That might be the last thing on your mind. That might be something that's like at the depths of your mind, something that you're like, you know what? Why would I bother? trying to find out how I'm going to somehow fit this whole entire lifestyle habit into my life when I haven't thought about it for, let's say, the last 27 years or so, right? It doesn't make any sense if you think about it. So for as many people that do go out there and sign up for gym memberships and then never go, right, there's a huge amount of portion of people out there who just don't do anything and, and they're very happy in, in the decision. And I think that's where I kind of want to be. I kind of want to get there. I kind of want to get in a position where I never feel like I'm a loser when I'm around people who are winning. Because I think that's what you have to do. You have to kind of, be- that's, what, that's what they have, right? Because the thing that I have that's annoying is that whenever I see someone doing something that looks cool and they're fucking smashing it, it makes me re-question the decisions that I've made. And I start thinking, man, I should do this, I should do that. You know what I mean, it, it gets me fired up and it gets me going. But then again, it adds another thing onto my plate. But some people out there can just generally watch someone do something amazing and be like, wow, that's very cool. Nod, 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 and just keep it moving and think nothing of it like two seconds later, which is a fucking amazing skill to have. I wish I had that. Honestly, it would make life so much simpler. But, you know, I think we're just those. It's just different type of people. You're made differently in that respect. So um, for those people who are not bothered um, that, well, I could see they didn't come to the gym overall. And in general, just, you know, there was no difference, really. Everything was as it seems. Everything was as it was. Previously, the other days, um, I didn't have that much trouble getting weight placed this time because there weren't weren't as many people in the gym, so I was able to kind of move around a lot. I did squats for the first time in a long time, which I've kind of been putting off for a while because I feel like it it was getting me, I was getting a bit too big from it. I kind of put on, I kind of put on weight, whether it's muscle or just fat, really quickly. So whenever I started doing squats, I kind of felt like I was like rounding off a bit. I was kind of getting a little bit rotund and all that malarkey. So I kind of had to like lay off a bit for a bit. But I really, really enjoyed doing some squats today. I did them a bit assisted though because I didn't want to do them with too many. I didn't want my legs to be too widely spread. I didn't want my ankles to collapse too much. So what I did is I put like little um, 1 kg 
Well, one kg. They're about yeah. They're basically no. Oh no, sorry. They're about. They're, I think they're zero point one. They're not even yeah. They think they're think zero point one kg plates. Really thin ones under my heel, just to kind of give me a little bit more of an extra step on my heel, and then make sure my heel, make sure my toes on the floor. I didn't want to do make sure my heels on the floor. That kind of malarkey. And then when you go in the squat, the usual kind of crossfit position of making sure you know your toes are facing straight and you're trying to or or, or facing right in front of you, and you're trying to push your knees as far out possible as you can to do it. Um, it's a squat technique that most people can do if you've got good mobility in your hips, in your ankles, and your knees. But I don't really have that, and also didn't want to. And also didn't want to forego not doing a squat because I don't have the mobility. So I kind of did a bit assisted. It's a bit of a cheat. It's not really the best thing to do. It might build up some bad habits, but overall, I'm not doing it with a band. I'm not kind of holding on to it. I'm not doing it in the flipping Smith machine or anything or that kind of malarkey. I am kind of doing it in a normal squat rack. But I'm just making sure to put the plates under my heels so I can just make sure that I'm making keeping my feet straight and I'm pushing up my knees. So I'm hoping then when I then get all my mobility back and my ankles start to open up a little bit more, that I can then start to kind of lower my heels a bit more and do them without having the plates underneath my heels. But that was quite fun. Did a did a few of those and then the wad today was a bit of a brutal one. I did like a one thousand meter row, um, then twenty five dumbbell swings. I mean twenty five kettlebell swings and then twenty five um, what are they called? dips uh, from a stationary position so that, that was all for time i did a thousand meters a row in about four minutes 20 i've kind of I'm, i've done it before at a really fast pace about three minutes 50 i managed to do it but this time i wasn't really going as fast as i, I wasn't consistent as i could could have been but still the row machine just when you think you figured it out it always kind of kicks your ass in it it's a fucking brutal brutal machine but i love it in terms of full body cardiovascular whenever you get off that machine you always feel as if like your whole body is like throbbing and crying out of a pain so that's always kind of a good thing to kind of rest on but um yeah apart from that day's been pretty nice and solid loads of reading done Loads of all that malarkey, kind of making sure I'm gonna get my bra- my brain nice and prepared. Then I'm heading, um, then I'm gonna prepare my mix for later on today. I'm heading off to a tapis to go play this weekend, which should be quite nice on, on Friday actually. If you listen to this on the Friday, I'm playing here there later, so make sure I get all my stuff prepared. I don't, I usually, even though I play on a controller when I'm playing in that pub. I usually like to have a little place prepared anyway in general. I don't like to go into things blind. The times I've gone into sets blind and just thought, I'll just play what I've got on my USB. It's been a nightmare because, you know, you've got over, I don't know, 300 tunes on USB, right? And you get you get basically uh, paralysis by analysis, right? That quote from um, Tim Ferriss in the four-hour work week. I think I'm in the four-hour body, right? When you just have too much information and you just don't make any decisions. That happens a lot to, with us individuals, right? So the, the main course of action is to kind of just settle for one or two sources of information, one or two tools, and just do a, do what you can with what you have available. And then as the time progresses, build on top of it. So sometimes when you DJ 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 the accent comes out again. The African accent comes out when it wants to. But sometimes when you're DJ and you have too many songs on your USB or you have your whole library with you, you can sometimes get stumped and you feel like you don't know what to pick next. But then when you, even even when you see DJs play on, on YouTube, you can you watch some some of the big ones, even some guys that come onto Boiler Room or other little things like Be At TV and stuff. You can see the ones that get flustered or get worried about their set because they, they've literally brought too many things with them. They haven't, very, they haven't concentrated down their USB. Now, it could just be taking your USB that you usually have all your tunes on and just and just making another folder of like songs that you want to play for the set or songs that you're thinking about playing for that set you're playing, you're playing it, right? I've done that previously. So you don't need to make a whole playlist what you want to play like front to back. I do it because I'm a psycho. I have to have structure and then I can veer off it. So I have a structure set out in place. Like I'll have like the beginning, the middle and the end of what I want to play. But then I can veer off it. I have other folders of like, you know, that just random songs. But then the random songs make more sense when I've adopted the structure. Then I can kind of improvise with stuff I've got there. So, um, but another way to do it, if you want to cheat way, is to kind of prepare a playlist of songs, just five or ten Things that you're thinking about playing on the night, and then just play those songs, and then from there you can then grab all the stuff in your library and then kind of incorporate them. But in my experience, going completely blind and just saying, "Okay, I'm just going to go into my library and decide what I want to play," is always a recipe for disaster. Personally, for me, personally for me, but other people might be a bit different. They might like the whole improvisation of it. I listened to um, Elena Colombi, who's kind of a, a really good DJ here in London, who I met a few years back during the days of Love Fever and stuff, and she's kind of rose up the ranks and become like a superstar. But she mentioned on the on the RA podcast, a resident advisor exchange podcast recently um i forgot who she's on there with somebody else actually i'll link it in a minute but um she mentioned a really good interview there she was basically saying that how she likes to go into every set that she does completely blind like she just you know f- figures it out on the spot which i guess is only is something that you can probably do when you've got more experience um i assume so but also it's, it's some it's just horses for courses in it 
it's like when everyone found out that Jay-Z didn't write his raps and all the rappers started to like, you know, do the same sort of thing. Some people just listen to music differently, just pick it up in different sort of ways. So you can't necessarily, you know, do the same thing he done and think you're going to get the same results kind of things. Do it, kind of practice what works best for you, find a method that works and then kind of, you know, iterate onwards and upwards. So yeah, that's what I'm doing for this weekend. And then I think I might have a set again on a Saturday too, Saturday afternoon at probably the Star of Bethnal for a couple of hours. That should be cool. Swing in there, play some disco tracks and then come back home. So all in all, not too bad, right? Not too bad of a weekend there. It's nice and set. Um, keeping it nice and clean, nice and sober for the most part. Um, not not much of a sober sort of champion thing. Like, oh, I'm going to do this for the for the, for the the month. It's just more sort of like, you know, it's January, right? You've had, um, for the, when, whenever whenever the winter months come around, it is usually the time that I've, I think sometimes people veer off their diet, right? Or they get a bit, you know, they get a bit gluttonous or they start drinking too much because, you know, it's cold you're indoors you're hanging out with friends you're catching up it's time to kind of you know share some drinks and get a bit leery so it only makes sense in general just to kind of you know rein it in a bit not i'm not saying completely erase it not do those things but just you know pull it back a little tiny bit and then you know you never know where you might be so that's my that's my weekend plans for the most part that i'm doing Anyway, um, enough about my life updates and probably more about topics and stuff. Before I jump into it, topics actually, I just started. Um, I watched the first episode of Surviving R. Kelly. Just, uh, I think, yeah, yesterday night, and yeah, wow, man. Um, a lot's been said about R. Kelly. I think uh, everyone's kind of familiar with the case of Rule, but it's been it's been quite a peculiar one for me because I kind of grew up knowing what had happened right i think that it might have happened when i was maybe in secondary school the whole like p tape thing and the whole marrying Aaliyah before that blah 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 you heard of all these things about him and obviously the really the extremely lewd r&b songs all that malarkey but for the most part if you're an r&b here especially me growing up when i was younger i used to love listening to r&b right um back in the day when entertainment crew used to play on the uh, deja vu and they used to always have like an r&b set an r&b kind of hour and a half to two during the end of it and another dude too used to play r&b i forgot on deja vu i forgot his name a couple of other dudes used to play r&b but r&b was a big thing for me i used to make mix it so i wasn't really that um protrude by the whole lewd language thing but i do remember whenever you played you know r kelly type stuff or whatever it may be katie and jojo black street out loud in your house sometimes your mom would maybe sometimes have some things to say in it number one she had questions about whether, what girl you were seeing right and making sure they weren't jamaican or some shit right <laughs> and then number two uh, making sure that you turned down because this guy was talking about you know i don't know madness on the flipping r&b song but what always kind of intrigued me and i, I never really dug into to find out what what happened was why it seemed like every you know before social media came before social media there was really a thing r kelly was always accused of these things right always accused of some kind of you know lewd sexual act against women but nothing ever seemed to happen you know albums kept coming out he kept performing he kept touring and nothing nothing seemed to happen it just seemed to be like a constant you know thing that happened so someone would accuse him and he just couldn't he just sweeps under the rug or everyone kind of forgets about it after i don't know a couple of weeks or so and this was before social media but still i remember there was a lot of traffic around his name regarding the things that he might have done or not have done right allegedly done that might have been in the industry and i always used to think like how is it that he just like completely got away with this like what's happened here right and obviously over the years i've gotten a little bit more educated and kind of you see different cases come up whether it's a harvey weinstein thing um whether it's the things happened with bill cosby whether it's the stuff that's happened with judge kavanaugh in america um loads of other cases you're starting to get a little bit more familiar with what's happening and you start to realize that it's quite difficult especially when these things are said after the fact right to kind of convict somebody on allegations based primarily on he says she said right um so then i understood then why you know there's there's kind of stats out there that say you know the conviction rate for uh rape is surprisingly low and also the women that come around that the women that are prepared to kind of testify or subject themselves to rape kits is comp comparably low too i've like gone through that experience because you know there's so much kind of risk um associated with it and you know the pain associated with going through that experience and try having to relive it in order to kind of seek justice blah blah, blah. loads of things the system that are deficient that kind of make that kind of inadvertently um make it so those kind of things happen quite often because there's not that much of a deterrent and even more so even worse so probably with celebrities right because they feel like they're untouchable for the most part right um you you rise to lofty ranks you get you work all your way up into a, a position of power and some celebrities not all but some celebrities feel it as a point um feel their obligation 
to kind of, you know, enact, enact revenge on those that kind of spurned them um, when they were coming up, right? They used it as a platform then to kind of be the nasty person, right? It's sort of similar to, remember that Black Mirror episode where that geeky guy at work who gets bullied and stuff, when he goes into the game, he he then becomes the, you know, the the, the kind of tyrannical boss, right? He kind of takes a piss out of everybody. He turns people into different things. Remember, like, he makes the woman make, make sure she can't speak, she doesn't have a mouth and whatever. He starts to, he, he does all the stuff that the bullies did to him back to other people, right? So sexual sometimes assault, especially with um, celebrities, it kind of sometimes feels like they do the same thing. It's, that, it's, it's in that kind of realm, right? They're, it's like a weird sort of, get back right but of course the victims in it are no you know this isn't a music matter for the victims involved because they're having to live with this experience like you know for years and years and years until maybe the day that they die especially if the person doesn't come to justice but obviously over the years with the whole rise of the whole um, me too movement and believing the accusers and extra kind of uh, eyes being paid attention to other cases that have happened you know it's been come to our attention again that these things are still out there and r kelly again another story came out that he was supposed to be having run in a sex cult that girls were being held under their un, uh against their will or under duress and parents hadn't seen their daughters in two and a half years whatever it may be and then we came to thinking like this guy's still at it right so i think there's been a concerted effort within the industry thankfully to kind of like sudden eventually put an end to it right okay this is enough like we need to everyone to be aware and then if you decide to do business with him again then it's up to you but everyone needs to be aware of what's going on and it and it to me it seems like the best form of social justice because sometimes with social justice it seems like they want to end your career want to make sure you don't you don't eat again you don't do anything in life blah 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 right which seems that sometimes can seem a little bit harsh especially when you when you especially when you compare it to the crime but in R. Kelly's case, considering what he's kind of done and he's kind of reckless abandoned and uh, he's he's kind of, I don't know if you call it confidence, but his lack of like, you know, regret at his actions. He hasn't tried to make amends. But like he's, he seems as if like he's just going on as if nothing, it's just not that big of a deal, right? And of course, you know, for some women out there, it's been even more disturbing to see videos of him in concerts with women kind of wiping down his tongue as he's performing and touching him up and still kind of lording over him when he's got all these mad things hovering over his head. So finally, you know, I guess everyone kind of banded together and they decided to release this um, documentary called Surviving R. Kelly, which is on Lifetime now. And I'm sure if you're not, if you're not in the US and you're in the UK, you'll be able to find it in all your usual <laughs> illegal um, streaming platforms, right? But, um, this documentary, I watched episode one the other day, last night actually, and wow, man. Again, a reminder of just how important it is for everyone to watch the documentary and again for everyone to make their mind up. I'm not saying he should go to prison, I'm not saying he should kind of run underneath for prison, um, uh, whatever it may be, but I think everyone needs to be made aware of his actions and then whoever don't wants to do business with him, whoever wants to book him, promote his shows, release his album, distribute his singles, it's up to you. But everyone needs to be made aware of what's going on because this guy has been getting away with murder for ages, bro. The stuff with Re Aaliyah, which I forgot about when, you know, because obviously I was super young when that happened, but it kind of reminded me of everything that happened at that time. It's interesting because nowadays, especially in hip hop or in the scene in general, the age thing doesn't carry as much as a taboo as it used to. I remember it being a big deal back in the day. Big, big, big deal. I remember even in my school, one boy in my school kind of like um, dealt with this girl who was kind of regarded as the most prettiest girl in our school in our secondary school and um what secondary school is what age 15 to 16 right 15 to, no 13 to 16 sorry about that right yeah um what was it 12 it should be 12 right because there's five years or 12 it should be 12 right 12 to 16 so it might, oh, that's not even 12 years what how many years is it, is it 11 you go to secondary school when you're 11 years old i guess so whatever it is anyway um the girl in year seven was regarded as the most prettiest girl in the school and obviously the the, the boy we were in year nine or ten no year nine year nine they say yeah we're in year nine we're in year nine at that time and she was in year seven but obviously if you're in secondary school and you're a kid right year nine is what you're what 13 maybe a 10 year old is like they might as well be a five year old to you if you're 13 really in it because you just you know you're hitting your kind of puberty sort of like bump just coming up right you're into different things you recognize girls as like not as sexual beings but like as a gender different to you right the last thing you want to do is hang around with a girl let, let alone a girl that's like you know in year seven right year seven's got a big taboo around it because these guys just come out of primary school right they're trying to you know flex their muscle but for the most part these kids are just kids for the most part so I remember that being a thing in our school. Like this, this kid in year nine was going out. This year, a girl in year seven, and it was a big problem, big big deal. And then they they, they continued going out of each other when he was in year ten and she was in year eight. And it, it was a kind of a big thing that he kind of just decided, you know, fuck it, 
I like this girl. We're gonna we're gonna do it, and they just didn't care. And I guess them not caring kind of like let people like you know they stopped kind of talking about it at the time. But it was a big deal. Like it was a situation like, yo, you are a creep. You're a perv. Like how can you be good going out with a girl that young? So I remember when the Arcadia Aaliyah thing came out, it was also a big deal because of course she was 27, she was 15 at the time. So what the fuck is going on here, man? This is nuts. But it seems as if nowadays in hip hop, it's not that big of a deal. It seems as if there's a lot of guys who are. Let's say, of course, if I guess the argument is that if they're of age, then it doesn't matter, right? But I don't know, man. Like, even if, even if you're, even if, even if the girl's banging, like, would you really want to date an eighteen-year-old when you're twenty-seven? Like, no, knowing how you were eighteen, knowing how girls are at eighteen, or knowing the kind of girl that would be in the industry at eighteen, um, wanting to hang around a twenty-seven-year-old, right? Because you know there might be an eighteen-year-old woman out there who would be a great fit for a twenty-seven-year-old man. But, you know, she's not the kind of person that's kind of be hanging around in studios, you know, and sort of like hanging after. I don't know. It's a different kind of person. And in general, anyway, it just seems weird to me overall. Right. Um, I was never the kind of person that had like friends in loads of different year sets. I might I might have had a few friends in the year below and maybe the year just below that if they were like my brother's friends and stuff. But I didn't really hang around with her, you know, because I guess it's different if you're one of those kids that you grew up, you went into a school where you had friends in different year groups or whatever. But I never really had that. I had maybe two fr two friends in that are in sixth form maybe two that i knew that were sixth form or college that get to, came back and, and and told me stories how they go to a school where you don't have to wear uniform it's like huh, and you go in how you go in is that you scan your card in front of a gate that was it but for the most part all my friends are in my year so to i can't even imagine what dating a girl you know let alone a girl two years younger than you imagine fucking 10 12 13 15 it's like fucking hell these guys are absolutely nuts but again watching the documentary it brings it all to light it reminds you of that situation and just you know regardless of what you believe is right or right or not like just seeing the amount of broken it's it's just, it's just it just it just go it just went it just reminded me of how many people are affected by the actions of one person you know inadvertently like the amount of broken people he's left behind in his trail of course they're not broken they're survivors they're prospering they're really brave to step out there and, and display their story and tell their truth but you know the amount of damage he's caused through his own selfishness is just abhorrent really isn't it really think about it you don't really it's like something that you can't really wrap your head around like just being so selfish in your own head wanting you know and preying upon these, you know, young, impressionable young ladies in the industry who just want to get on and stuff. And, you know, again, and the whole getting on thing. I think there's a, you hear some, a couple of girls in the documentary say something along the lines of, ah, oh, we want to be stars, right? Um, um, you hear a lot of girls in the documentary or women say in the documentary, or their friends told them, hey, this is your big chance. Now, the girls and their friends aren't telling them, hey, this is your big chance. Do whatever you got to do to get your get the role. But there is an understanding that, you know, part of the reason why you're in the room is because you're a pretty girl, right? They're kind of using, you know, the fact that you're pretty and you're young and you can sing as a means to kind of propel to propel your career in the hope that you'd maybe communicate you maybe connect with other young, pretty people out there. It's natural. It's normal. It happens all the time. No problem. But to kind of take that and then spin it as some sort of um, invitation for you to like sexually assault or to make sexual advances to girls who are super impressionable, right? People who shouldn't even be in that kind of position, who shouldn't be um, sexually um, active in that way at all, right? Maybe sexually active in a way of like, you know, dating somebody your, your age, but then they shouldn't be sexually active at all in the way of like understanding what uh, what what power they have as, as a woman and what and what their sexuality and, and how they can use their sexuality for their own means. Like that shouldn't be anything that should somewhat a 16 or 15 year old girl should be having in their head at all. Zero at all. It should just be a thing of like, okay, this guy wants me in a room because obviously he thinks I'm pretty and I can sing well, but that's it. Like we can all recognize, right? The girl's pretty. It's not, you don't need to pray on it. You can just say, she, you got a look about you that I'm sure a lot of kids out there are going to like, especially young girls, especially young boys. We're going to promote you. We're going to put in the studio and make sure you record something and put it out there, but not prey on them and kind of take advantage. That's the thing that really disgusted me about the whole documentary. And again, like I said, regardless of what you think he did or didn't do, like that aspect of it is just like nasty, absolutely nasty. And there's not many people that kind of have had a good word to say about him. Not that that matters because, you know, people in the industry, especially in Hollywood, have probably the backbone of a fucking boneless chicken for the most part. But, you know, no one's really coming out and fighting for his defense, right? People have come out and kind of said what they have to say. The ones that don't want to get involved and not get involved, which again, I don't have any problem with. I saw John Legend made a tweet the other day talking about how he didn't think it was a big deal that he went. And um, what do you say? You said something along the lines of like he, uh, he made a comment on on um, the other day insinuating that he was 
he wasn't brave for stepping out that he, he did it because obviously um r kelly's a is a creep because i think he's one of the only dudes that's in the documentary outside of his family that have kind of like you know oh outside of his kind of immediate circle that have kind of you know saying stuff about him especially considering the amount of people that worked with him in the industry is it something that i kind of thought was a little bit disingenuous because again you're not you know you don't know everyone's situation you're not you know what i mean everyone's got different ways of dealing with things and stuff and sometimes I don't, and sometimes I'm not a believer that people's silence is like an, 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 you know, an indication that they agree or they co-sign someone's behavior. It just might mean they just don't want to get involved. Some people just don't want to get involved, and I think people should be allowed to not be not be involved. But um, John Legend kind of tweeted this the other day, which kind of you know made people talk in in, in the scene overall. He tweeted uh, to everyone telling me how courageous I am for appearing on the documentary, which I mentioned, uh, surviving R. Kelly. It didn't feel risky at all. I believe these women and don't give a fuck about protecting a serial child rapist easy decision, which is fine, right? He's allowed to make that decision and that's more than happy for him to do that. But I don't think the suggestion that, you know, others are not coming out because, you know, they don't get they don't give a fuck about it it's true because some people just don't want to get involved it's too messy because again as we saw with the kevin hart situation and other things have happened sometimes you step in front and some of these people out here these social justice warriors are not are not content with this happening they want more drama to be associated with it, more takedown so you step out of it and then they start digging into your past and and re-releasing stuff and rehashing interviews and stuff that you said in the past and in an effort to kind of bring you down which i think is just abhorrent and disgusting We've got we've got the target. We've got someone that needs to be taught a lesson, that needs to be applied to the industry overall, right? Something that needs to be known that like, hey, this is not cool. We don't we don't approve of this, and then kind of everyone can kind of go about their their life and hopefully rebuild from the point you know of, of disaster that they've kind of been through. But I don't think everyone needs to get involved. I don't think that's everyone's place because you know sometimes we've all been there, man. We've seen people talk in front of cameras about big issues, and we've kind of been ish- annoyed because we felt like they've done more harm than good because they don't really know what they're talking about. That's, you know, that happens because they don't have the information, they're not very skilled at maybe speaking, whatever it may be. But, and again, some if you're invested and you give a fuck and you want to get involved, get involved. But if you don't, don't get involved. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're, you know, you're complicit in it or you're co-signing his behavior. That's not true whatsoever. But again, like I said, I, I re- highly recommend documentary. I highly recommend you check it out. It's called Surviving R. Kelly. It's on, it's on now on Lifetime if you're in the US. But if you're based anywhere else, you'll be able to find it anywhere else on every streaming. Wherever else you watch, however else you watch things in general, you should be able to find it on there. And I'm sure clips will be floating about. But I highly recommend you check it out. So far, I think it's two episodes. I'm not sure how long it's going to be. But I highly recommend you check it out. Surviving R. Kelly is out now. Um, what else is next on this docket list here? I want to rattle through some topics. Um, another fear of God and Nike collabs. Okay, so this I saw the other day on Hypebeast, or just no, it the other day. Yeah, basically the other day it dropped, and it's, it appears as if you know there's more um, fear of God shoes planned. Um, according to the comments of this article too on Hypebeast, it looks like they're gonna maybe put out a skate shoe, something along along in the kind of maybe the skate shoe mold in that kind of arena, which might make a lot of sense considering the stuff that um, Jerry Lorenzo has done with Vans and the stuff he's done with Paxson, all those kind of stuff that might lend itself there. You know, the kind of you know. I got influence, but another shoe kind of released that looks like another version of the Fox shoe that I thought was maybe one of the best shoes of maybe last year. You know, it's a toss up between a few other models out there, but you know, in terms of an original approach, in terms of something that fitted into his kind of brand DNA, in terms of something that was kind of you know different from what was on the market, I thought those releases were really cool. But this was like another model that's just re- that's just kind of leaked now. Um, again, you've got the similar sort of um, lower similar sort of midsole for the most part right with the exposed air bubble similar to like an air 180 but then on the upper you've kind of changed it instead of having the laces be the kind of uh straps that kind of secure it into place you've got extra straps on the on the outside so really thick straps um on the outside that kind of tie it all together that remind me i forgot that jordan or is it a lebron or is it a kobe there's a sort of a particular basketball shoe that has that kind of really thick strap that kind of wraps around so that's kind of something that's leaked the other day um here what we have there we have like an srs airbag i'm not sure what that oh that's a car sorry that's someone's car that took the picture i thought that was an airbag on the the shoe but yeah it looks it looks quite nice a nice new box finish on the upper so nice strap so we're going to see a few more models coming out of the um, fear of god um, trainers with Nike which is nice to see I think probably one of the best collaborations coming up so far but I don't know for you guys or me in general I'm a little bit you know have I probably had enough of leaks you know I used to I used to really enjoy when I used to buy a lot of shoes or be involved in the sneaky community in general right I used to really like when I used to see a lot of uh, line sheet sometimes right of shoes remember when like the retro air maxes or the retro air 180s or 
or I don't know, wherever, Air Max Lights, whatever it may be, right? The retro shoe, and they'll, you know, someone will be talking about it. Oh, I saw this particular thing at a sales event, blah, blah. They want to take pictures, but then someone will put out a line sheet, like an order sheet, right? And that was quite cool because it's just like, you know, eventually, essentially, it was just like a Photoshop file, like a PSD file with like all the colors listed and the, you know, and the prices. So you kind of imagine, oh, sick, they're going to retro that color, that color, that color. But it wasn't the actual model itself. Or you might get a leak of one colorway or whatever, and then you have to imagine what the rest of them come in. But it seems as if nowadays, of course, you know, with the with sneaker with sneaker with the sneaker culture being as big as it is now, it seems like every other day we're getting a leak of an entire shoe range or an entire collection or an entire capsule collection. And I feel like sometimes it's taking away from the magic of actually receiving the thing, like of actually um, announce of actually the person announcing it or the brand announcing it what it's needed to be, and you getting it and, and it being a bit of a surprise. Now you know some what what some when something's coming out months and months in advance. Uh, on top of that, the the brands themselves are creating this kind of like you know manufacturer scarcity complex, right, in the industry where they're pretending like they can't make the amount of shoes that they should be able to make because it's limited edition, which then creates this un you know this this un parallel demand there's not enough shoes to, to fulfill that demand which then require you know requires you to pay double the price on resale crazy lines whatever it may be stupid bots in order to kind of purchase a shoe so it kind of feeds into this whole nonsense so they hype up a shoe they leak a shoe really early get it loads of hype and traction purposely um manufacture less pairs in order to kind of drive the demand for it that demand can't be met and of course all the customers freak out they can't get a pair and then everyone's left with nothing and, who, and the only person that wins is a brand because they get all the engagement, all the marketing kind of buzzword upticks that they want for their KPIs get met and no one wins. But I think overall, going back to it, taking a step back, the leak thing needs to end. Who wants to see leaks? Like, I don't care about seeing leaks so far ahead of advance. I don't need that. I just need the shoes to be released when they say they're going to be released, to be released in a good enough quantity for everyone to get them and to have like a, a, a what you call it, a fairly straightforward release um uh, process yeah? that doesn't involve me having to retweet like a comment share this uh stick something up my ass like i don't want to do with that nonsense right i just want to buy the bloody shoe i don't want to go through all these nonsense of jumping over these crazy barriers or to kind of buy a shoe it's ridiculous right the 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 person who decided the person who kind of convinced us all that entering a raffle in order to buy a shoe was a great way to kind of buy something is a genius right because back in the day raffles when i was a kid meant that you were going to get the thing for free you paid you paid like a fraction of the cost for the item right you might buy a raffle ticket during school term for a quid and you get into, into a draw and you might win something that's worth a thousand pounds right that was the whole point of a raffle but nowadays a raffle means you just get the chance to buy a shoe which is fucking insane, right? If if only entering the raffle just meant you just entering your email address. No, it's not enough. It's not just to give them your email address. You have to give them your name. You have to give them sometimes your bank card so you have something to charge against it. You have to sign up for the fucking newsletter. You have to share something. You have to tweet that. Enter you in your size in the comments below. Share an image. Post an, an emoji in the comments. Like, what the hell is going on? But then they want to leak stuff six, six, seven, eight months in advance. I don't get it. I don't get who's doing it. It might be the brands. It might just be eager beaver sneakerheads. If you're an eager beaver sneakerhead, you're launching, you're leaking it. You're affecting maybe the release schedule of the shoe. Maybe if it leaks too far ahead and the reception isn't met that well, especially if the guys are reading comments and stuff like that, as they probably should be, the might the shoe might not drop in the end. You're ruining the surprise for the designer or the brand that's doing a collaboration because maybe there's a special um a special thing that project they want to do in order to launch it in the right way but in terms of you know we, we get fatigued when we see things so early in advance it finally drops we don't get around that's the problem that fashion industry is having at the moment the fashion industry shows a runway show in paris and then by the time you can buy it in the store the allure of what you saw in, on the runway is far as far gone so they're, they're trying to appeal to this you know what we have now in the streetwear community to kind of direct to consumer as you see it when, when you see it, it's going to drop very very soon kind of model but what we're doing now with the sneakers is kind of we're kind of going back to that we're, we're, we're fucking leaking these shoes way 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 in advance and then hoping that we're the first to kind of on, be on the scoop and get all our fucking social media metrics up and then when the shoe comes out we can't buy them anyway i don't know what's going on anyway the shoe's nice it's lovely i get it well don't get me wrong but i just want to see less leaks i want to see less leaks and i want to see shoes come out in a good enough quantity so we can all buy them and everything be nice because it doesn't make any sense now the whole reason why leaks are coming out this early is because sneaker community is blown it's global now it's fucking massive it's huge business billion dollar industry everyone's involved in it right? you've got 16 year old kids out there becoming instagram famous because they buy shoes and sit around in fucking supreme louis vuitton gear it's a big business like if it's a big business just to give people the shoes that they want produce enough quantity so they can buy them and they'll still sell out regardless anyway i'm not saying they i'm not saying they should make 
uh, these available in fucking Foot Locker and JD Sports, but just make enough so everyone, that, people that want them, we're going to buy them. Because if, even if you put these in JD Sports, a particular customer, JD Sports customer, won't probably buy these shoes, right? They're probably a little bit too crazy for them, right? The Fear of God shoes, whatever else it may be, or the Tom Sachs um, Nike collaboration. But make enough of them so the people that are interested in those kind of things can buy them. And we'll buy them anyway. We'll buy them all out, man. God damn it. And if we don't, it doesn't mean it's not your shoe is not success because it didn't sell out as well. What's this net metric of like if it doesn't sell out, it's not successful? Like, I want to see them on people's feet. That's all I want to see. But anyway, what do I know? What do I know? Next on the docket here, we have Human Made Summer 2019. A lot of streetwear stuff in this um, episode, so please bear with me. Some lookbooks I've saw that I thought were quite interesting. Um, human made of course from um from uh, nego fame who's formerly of a bathing ape it's a brand i've kind of always kind of kept my eye on haven't necessarily purchased um many things i've actually got a t-shirt human made that i purchased from a good enough sale back in it no it was a good enough sale I don't know where I purchased from. It might have been good enough sale. Anyway, I've got t-shirts. That's probably the only thing that I have of them so far. But anyone that I've spoken to that's worn, worn the clothes, anyone that I've seen that's got it on, has said only have only said good stuff about it, high quality, well made. And again, an extension of the work he kind of did at Baby Nate, but kind of, you know, a little bit more refined, less, less logo-y stuff, but with the kind of same sort of motifs that kind of, you know, we know and love of Nigo. And just in general, anyway, he's a master streetwear designer, right? Master, master streetwear designer. I don't think anyone can kind of really um, argue with that in that respect the fact that the way he's been able to kind of carry his dna his design dna codes into different different sort of collaboration different sort of brands working on the pseudonyms working behind the scenes it's been amazing and this lookbook kind of you know again satisfies my desire for more japanese items in my wardrobe so this is spring summer 19 i'm going to get it up here on the screen blah, blah, blah. so what do you have here quick let's see you have here a nice kind of look it looks like a bomber with some nice carpenter pants. He's always there's always a good carpenter pant in um in a human made collection. Pinstripe carpenter pants, you know, similar to what you might see a chef wear, but for the most part, kind of pinstripe carpenter pants are look really nice. I love the kind of Dr. Martins with the steel toe cap. They look cool. I'm 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 assuming there'll be a Dr. Martins collab involved there. Um again, nice little jacket there, nice combo pants. I love the jeans with the trousers kind of pulled up. I rolled up again that's sort of similar look i was trying to do with my um balenciaga triple s's with you know with the denim and it sort of rolled up but i guess you'd probably need a shorter a shorter leg jean so you can kind of roll it up like quite slightly and have the the boots kind of exposed which i wish they do a, a good job of doing um again i, I love the human made logo there as well with a heart on it that's really nice so you've got nice sort of there's there's always you know nice americana nods that are involved in human made stuff, you know, because obviously Nigo's obsessed with all things American culture. So you've got here like a nice sort of kind of pilot's jacket, another one here that looks similar sort of vein, which says what like, futuristic teenagers, human made, um, which looks awesome. Great jeans, of course. Just just in just overall a great collection of clothes, and this jacket looks fucking banging. Futuristic teenagers collection. So it's 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 essentially got four pockets in the front. Uh, snap metal buttons it looks like for the most part the outfit just looks incredible too with the creepers this is that look overall is something i'd wear in an instant in an absolute heartbeat that looks so so cool um and then you've got more here you've got a nice little um jacket that kind of reminds me a little bit of play comedy gasso but I, lo I love the print with the heart with the sunglasses too the jeans too again the, these creepers are going to be something that might be something i have to add onto my list of once actually they come in a cream, it looks like, right? And uh, and a sort of like a grey. They look really nice here. And I love that bag as well. It's a nice little bag, nice little pinstripe shirt. And again, just overall, a really solid streetwear collection. You can't really go wrong with anything here. Nice little holster. Nice little pants. The suiting looks amazing. Nice button-ups. Good little half zips. Some great little um, kind of souvenir shirts that everyone's kind of wearing, similar to the sort of Prada stuff. That you might have seen in the past couple of seasons uh you got contrast pants i've just missed it actually they look really cool i love that the split pant there and of course just in general you know you know, nice overcoats and, and the boots look really cool i just love the looks overall so again i recommend you check it out human made spring summer uh 2019 collection um waste no time not waste no time but it just says on the title here but yeah so that looks really cool um you can i think yeah, they've got a pretty decent on, online store you can purchase most of their stuff on and get it delivered directly to you but it's it, it is it is on the expensive side it's not going to be um fairly cheap i'm not sure i'm not sure if there's, there's that many stores that carry it. i think mr porter might carry it 
overall. I'm not sure what other stores carry it overall. I'm not sure how popular that look is. It's kind of something that is only reserved for the heads, it seems like. The ones that really know, know, buy it for the most part. But yeah, I recommend you check that out. Human Made Collection is out. Uh, what else is on the list here? Do, do, do. Uh, Arise Spring Summer 2019. Another look board that I'm very interested in. Arise um, or Aries. I don't know how you pronounce it. Aries, Arise, Aries, Arise, Aries, Arise, Aries, Arise, Arise, Aries. I have no idea. But yeah, another brand I've kind of kept my eye on for the most part. Another really strong London based streetwear brand. Or oh, streetwear, or I don't know, whatever you might want to call them. I like them for that kind of look that they do anyway overall. They might be familiar with them. One of the designers um, or the main designer that designs for. Arise. I think it's a husband and wife team, right? For the most part, whatever the, the husband still does some designs for Palace and stuff. So he comes from that lineage and doing other things, record label, record labels, record sleeves and stuff like that, or artwork with that malarkey. So he has a very uh, storied background, and it's a brand I kind of was familiar with with back in the day. I don't know how I got. How did I, how did I find out about Aries or Arise? I'm not too sure. It might, it might just been through the Palace collection. I think so. Palace, oh, sorry, connection. But overall, I've been keeping an eye on it. I feel like what they've done. They used to concentrate mainly on their women's stuff. It was kind of mainly a kind of women's brand. But then over time, with the kind of taste, the collective taste um, changing and guys wanting to dress a bit more flamboyant, especially in streetwear, white, streetwear times, because, you know, it did, seem, it, it did kind of get a little bit you know, samey same in the whole streetwear lane, right? Everyone was kind of wearing the same sort of stuff. There wasn't a lot of bright colors, not a lot of patterns, but then it got a bit dandyish. I'd say maybe the last three or four years and a lot of these brands, brands like Pleasures and Brain Dead and all those kind of like, are kind of riding that wave really well because they're able to kind of tap into it and do it in a really kind of tasteful way. And I think uh, Aries Arise do it in the same way. I'm going to keep doing it twice. Aries Arise, Arise, Aries, uh, do it in exactly the same sort of way. And this lookbook is a good example of it so far. So this is for their spring summer nineteen collection. Um, everyone's kind of dropping it, dropping their stuff there now. I'm, I'm assuming we're going to hear from Supreme very soon in that in that regard because you know they've kind of closed. I think the last drop happened last year, right? In terms of last, last drop of the of the season overall, so everything else should be in sale now. And the spring summer should come in later on in the year. But yeah, so this lookbook looks cool. I love everything in it for the most part, like this fleece hoodie, this massive side bag as well. It looks fucking gnarly and cool. Fan of the shirt, I'm sure that's going to do well. You have got a nice paneled um, sweater here. This outfit looks incredible, floral, on like off-white, a bit of cream with a snakeskin belt. Looks lovely, 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 jubbly. And that's a little detail here that I've noticed a lot of people are doing too, like taking like jackets, stuff that could be worn as a jacket or as like an overshirt, but then tucking into a trousers. So it's sort of like a zip shirt, which I would traditionally wear. Yeah, it's basically a jacket in a sense. I'd, you'd, I'd j j definitely wear that just as a regular jacket with a white tee inside or something, or a contrasting tee, but I'm liking the little styling things people do on the shirts where they tuck it into the pants overall. And it gives it a nice little look. Um, got some nice shirts here again that I think look amazing. Is that meant to be a penis on the shirt? That's nice, funny. Nice little illustrations on there. Um, so suiting as well. Is that a suit from Horizon they're doing? Is that double-breasted suit? I'm seeing a lot of those coming in with a lot from a lot of brands. Double-breasted suits are kind of big. Maybe the whole 90s thing is sort of taking a hold. That looks nice to see. Nice fleece again. I think they did it last season, right? There's these sort of fleeces with um with the contrasting pocket um in different sort of material. It looks really cool. Got a logo tee here underneath. That looks nice. Again, the, the patterns on the shirt and the trousers look great. Um, nice t-shirts again nice jumpers here with the logo upside down i love this shirt too i think it's sort of like a bowling shirt that's a pretty similar sort of thing too it's got like a black collar with like a black um contrast in pocket and then a floral print on it not sure what that model's called but that's nice i love this bag here actually there's like a little sort of leather bag it looks similar to like a bag that you'd carry um i, I know i've got one actually from luebe um it's it's the kind of bag that they give the sales assistants on the shop floor so you can kind of use that or maybe you know like kind of like a, a an upscale version of what a market trader would have to carry all their change in um it sounds like a leather pouch that looks really really nice and they, they they've done it in a leather with like the metal is that a metal is that a metal or gold logo here or is that embossed that looks really nice anyway regardless super super cool and what else you have here you have another shirt 
good again the logo shirt's probably gonna do really well especially especially all they need is one one of these guys in the scene to wear it right and asap rocky or somebody somebody one of those big artists to wear it and it's fucking gone and then that logo t will just you know it'll just keep selling through season in season out um i'm hoping so anyway i hope they they be able to sell a lot of these bits because this look awesome oh and i love 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 this fucking sweater it looks so comfy with the with the pattern on it again and i love this bag it reminds me a little bit there was there was a a margella bag similar a few seasons ago from their um from the mm6 collect collection that's sort of like the diffusion line it had a similar sort of zip on it and the head port have a similar sort of messenger bag the same sort of zip too it kind of zips all the way around the top so kind of like a, a half o kind of thing which is really nice um nice chunky zip there hoping that's a nice re 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 zip there nice and heavy nice jumpers again again just overall great great collection nice b couple of bits from the women's as well here nice little holster top there it looks quite cool shirt jacket jeans oh look they've got got a nice little are those are those on top of each other or are those jeans stitched in they look quite nice they remind me again of the what vetman did a couple of seasons ago what margella did originally and i think what white project did as well similar too where they kind of stack where they kind of um stitch jeans into each other so they kind of had these stacks going on top of them uh but let's also did it in a collection too recently too where they were kind of different panels like sort of like imagine someone put on Imagine someone put on shorts over their jeans sort of thing, but then stitched them down. That's what they kind of look. It reminds me of a little bit. Um, and again, loads of nice little women pieces, tops, hoodies, nice little comfy um, jumpers. Um, these these have been everywhere, isn't it? I think H&M got them. There's sort of like a pile, cozy jumper things that usually in cream, they're not really in adventurous colors because everyone's kind of following uh stuff that kind of happened on the runway a few seasons back but you know i'm sure we're gonna see all this stuff happening you know it you know being shown on the on the high street very 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 soon um what else we have here and i think that's about it isn't it really yeah again the whole sort of top looks really nice on women and that's sort of long sleeve so yeah i recommend you check it out um arise spring summer 19 lookbook collection is there yeah some nice actual pieces there really really nice pieces to pick up on and the price points are, are fairly decent as well considering um what they have been able to make from a, like a cut and sew perspective so i recommend you check that out but but boom what else is on the list here da -da -da -da. one trick pony strikes again oh okay <laughs> this is regarding um you know maybe it's a little bit mean to say one trick pony but um it seems like we're gonna we're gonna be um subjected to another pigeon dunk release from the legend that is jeff staple um we've seen it kind of leaked a few times and spoken about on websites and people have been speaking about this whole thing over coming up again and i guess for there is a there is a small contingent there is a small group of people out there there's a small diehard group of sneakerheads out there who who will buy just about anything and everything out there right and who just want to be part of all the kind of nonsense and all the kind of stuff that happens during sneaker release day for them it's just something that kind of galvanizes them and makes them feel like they're, they're alive and whatever right but there is also a group of people out there like me i would assume who just don't want to do anything to do with that want to see innovative products want to see fresh products want to see stuff made well and want to see also companies taking and responsibility actively and ensuring the safety of their customers right we've had stories come out of people being shot people being stabbed and stuff at releases and for this, for some reason or like it like it or not all the blame gets put on top of the stores that are issued these shoes and whatever it may be and people kind of lauded them and said they should be keeping their customer safety but in general it's at the responsibility of the brands to make sure the shoes are produced enough in order to make sure everyone's if it fills demand then no nonsense has to occur on release day but again you know here we are many years on they haven't really um got down they haven't really sorted out how to release shoes really in a, in a really you know exact way that kind of works for most people the sneakers app is whatever right it's a bit hit and miss for the most part um the whole kind of reserving something and having to pay for it and all that having to your credit card details on on file is not something that everyone's everyone's comfortable with sharing stuff on social media i've made my position clear on that i fucking hate it i think it's fucking stupid right so they haven't even sorted all that stuff out yet but they still want to push these kind of you know boom um, crazy um bombastic releases right in the hope that they're going to garner loads of coverage over media but then they're going to take no responsibility if some fucking nonsense happens right? it gets crazy and i'm saying this uh, with the reality that the new york based or the kind of american based sneakerhead the one that wants to buy everything and anything and will do just about anything and everything to buy whatever is limited for the flip or whatever it is or just for the clout that person right needs to be um 
you need to pay attention to that cus- to, to that customer. You can't drum up hype over a shoe that might not release in a lot of places, release it limitedly, and then take no responsibility that customer is being put into danger. And now we're seeing that the pigeon dunk, which is a you know one of the kind of shoes that represents, in my opinion, the demise of the overall sneakerhead community. You know because it kind of preyed on just hype for hype's sake. It wasn't necessarily a shoe that people really liked or thought that was a cool. I looked amazing just because it sold for crazy amounts because you know it garnered loads of attention on New York tabloids and newspapers, whatever it may be, that people want to kind of be part of the story and of course jeff staple sits there as a kind of orchestrator of this whole mess um and being somebody who kind of you know i've kind of grown to understand over the years listening to the podcast but still someone that kind of but ba- ba- just really baffles my mind overall you know he's had this one trick that he's been kind of consistently playing upon over and over and over again he might have other work that we are not aware of but for the most part anything that we know of that kind of gets pushed out there a lot by him is his kind of close industry friendships and the fact that he had this one shoe that he released ages ago that he's now going to flip again put in another colorway in the hope that it's going to kind of get everyone's attention and you know blow up the internet once again and again like i said it's just not safe it's just not safe on the streets for people like this i'm not sure if this is the right way to go about things but whatever um there's a video out at the moment kind of speaking about what he wants to do that I kind of want to speak on and lend some commentary let's hear what he has to say and let's see if maybe maybe I've read it all wrong and maybe he's going to do it in a good ethical way people are going to be able to get their shoes no one's going to get severely injured I'm hoping not cross cross our T's dot our eyes on that malarkey but here's the video let me get it up here blah 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 blah, blah. where is it boom there we go do, 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 do. get it up here on the screen So, you know, the last time you guys came to shoot to come up, it was in our old office. And our old office was really dope. Everyone just sort of shared like a big loft space, uh, except me, I had my own office. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my team, like, you know, we were growing. So there was sort of like a request to be like, let's upgrade the office and just to get you some sort of perspective on time. We dropped the Black Pigeon in November of 2017. And then we moved offices just a month later, started unpacking all the stuff. And I started to show some of the prototype samples that were rejected in the process of making the Black Pigeon. Like blowing up my stories, blowing up my IG, and kids were just like fiending. That's essentially what he lives for, right? Just loads of kids just fiending over his Instagram stream. He's essentially, you know what he is? He's essentially the sneaker head version of uh, Ben Baller, really, isn't it? He's just like this this kind of like man child that kind of like preys on young kids in order to kind of validate him. But the moment they say anything against him, he kind of switches. Well, to be fair, I've not really seen um, Jeff Staple kind of get mad on, on, on social media for the most part. But again, it's just like a, it's such a nonsense release, right? So the, the, the original pigeon came out, then a black pigeon came out, and now we get another black pigeon. For what reason? To commemorate what? And then when you see the bottom of the shoe, they've got, it's got like an icy sole shoe. I think it's, a, it's an icy sole see-through whatever it may be how do you describe it and then inside the sole are newspaper clippings of all the news of all the kind of front page headlines that the original pigeon kind of garnered um for that release i'm assuming it's the original one it might be the the black pigeon i'm not too sure but come on like you know what you're doing you're obviously doing it in a hope that it's going to create another bit of viral marketing for you and i'm sure he's going to use this bit of viral marketing to then lend himself you know some more um, content marketing gigs for the next kind of year or five years or whatever content it needs to be but i assume you know for the uh, ions and ions to come but it's just like come on man there's got it has to be more he has to offer this guy's been around from the very um onset in the very beginning he's friends with some of the most influential people in the industry but it seems like he doesn't seem to have any sort of fresh new ideas to kind of push out there and it should be a there should be a moment again not me maybe i'm not person to speak about it because you know maybe the money you get given the opportunity is too good to turn down but i would assume that once you've done something that great as a pigeon dunk right especially during that era of like silver box sbs and all that sort of malarkey i would assume it'd be quite a good opportunity to like you know take stock of your achievements and maybe t- put some distance behind it and also want to show people what you can do. Like show them a new trick. Sort of what I've said about um, the Joe Lorenzo and Fog collaboration, right? The Fear of God collaboration. It's also not something, again, that I would that I was overly anticipating. It's not something that I'd maybe wear in general, right? But I really appreciate the effort that he went to instead of just getting an Air Force One, instead of getting a Jordan One and just changing the color, which he could have easily done. It could have easily fitted into everything that he does already, right? He could have easily gone over to Adidas and done a, 
and done like a wife remodel, whatever he may want to do. Anything he wore in the past, we've seen him wear, we thought it looked cool. But instead of doing that with Nike collaboration, he decided to kind of take a new, build a new model from the ground up. Take a chance, right? And it could have completely fell flat. People could have thought it looked fucking shit. But luckily, it kind of it kind of went off, and then you double it with the with the Skyline as well as a good little kind of complement to the shoe. If you don't want something too crazy, you've got the Skyline to kind of rib on. So I appreciate the fact that he took a bit of a risk. But again, this you're making a black pigeon dunk, right? Something that he's quote unquote saying he designed. Like back in the day when people used to say they designed Nike IDs, you'd get laughed at the shop, right? Like, ah, oh, here's the shoe I designed on Nike ID. What you move around some colors. So imagine nowadays when people are making new models of shoes, right? They're having collaborations and they're not happy with like just having a color in a shoe, right? They're, they're taking stuff from the archive and kind of pulling it back into the kind of present day. Like Harry Preston with his sunglasses and shit. Maybe something you're not liking, but again, it, it takes a bit of, you know, it takes a bit of ingenuity, in, ingenuity, a little bit of innovation, a little bit of creativity spark to kind of be like, you know what? Let's not go that way. Let's go this way. But again, what we're seeing here is, him, again, this guy that's like 40 plus wanting to appeal to just children, right? Wanting to them to queue outside of a store for 18 hours for him to sign. Like, come on, man. This is nonsense. But hey, what do I know? Let's just play the video and continue. Had books, albums, comic books, toys. Really trying to like give like a history lesson. You know what I mean? And when I was showing... What's the, the history lesson? What history lesson can you give from taking pictures of your collection that you have in storage and uploading Instagram stories? Unless you're writing some good, interesting copy next to it. What, what is history? lesson oh look you know that you know that bear brick that came out in 2002 i got it still have it you know that shoe that came out in 2016 i got it still have it the kids know all the hype shit so it's the the whole education library is full of, is on stock x you can just look at everything that's like oh why is that going for so much money it came out in 2002 okay cool add it to my list you know what i mean that's education you need you don't need to go on someone's story and see them you know if it if anything that's just him waxing his own ego oh like give me a pat on the back guys look i've got all these shoes in storage like ugh samples we came across this one i had never designed a shoe that looked like this design so we just sort of took design leathers they had and a just dunk low sb together just to send me to be like All right. this is sort of what you're talking about obviously you know it's not what i'm talking about but i remember i just you know held that took that picture and then i said like rejected sample a panda and then a pigeon emoji and then a question mark within an hour that post ended up on all the blogs and it kind of went viral really fast I get a call from Nike. Just, you know, every picture that he's smiling in is when he's viral and when he's alone in his own big office, right? And kids are foaming at the mouth. Every, again, it's an illustration, don't get me wrong, it's not having to do with him, but everything that brings him joy is being viral, having kids queue up around the shop of his shoe, right? And that's, that's what that's what gives him joy right and i'm covering a box of shoes of stuff that i bought when i was bruv you've been around for ages man you've had a full-time job or you've had a proper job working industry for a long time you've made money you've been able to you've had contacts you've been able to buy the stuff that you desired like it's no surprise you have stuff it's no achievement no one's looking at that and being amazed that, oh wow just staple dude has been involved in the industry for 20 plus years had stuff that came out 20 plus years ago uh, it happens you know what I mean? like what the fuck and they're like dude everyone at beaverton's in an uproar over this post that you did i was like oh shit are they mad and they're like no 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 they're stoked on it you should take it down now i'm like why should i take it down and they're like because we should do something with the shoe and I so imagine rejected samples that jeff staple made for the second black for the second black pigeon dunk he posted his Instagram story. Nike employees see it. They freak out because, again, people's memories are so... Imagine if people make the shoe, forgot that they made the shoe a year ago with a, a guy that rejected... Or whatever time they, they they rejected the sample. And now they're thinking, oh, actually, nice thing you reminded us. Like, come on, guys. Like, and I'm assuming it's tying in with the whole, like, dunk, dunk resurgence that Virgil's doing, re, re wearing loads of dunks and stuff. But imagine, no one in this, no one in that kind of building in Beaverton had an idea of, like, maybe pulling out the shoe and approaching Jeff Staple first. It was him posting stuff on Instagram stories that kind of sparked the idea, which kind of is a bit, what, bit bewildering, isn't it, considering? Now, maybe not because, you know, they've got uh, thousands of releases of shoes they're probably doing every quarter at the least, right? So they're probably not, you know, overly concentrating on something that they rejected time ago, but still, come on. You don't know, like? And I was like, oh, okay, I'll take it down. <laughs> so took down the post, which made people be like, oh, Jeff just took down the post. Again, that hype, hype, so hype, put down the post. Oh, and then this guy, I don't hype, he's just like disgusting, isn't it? Could take so happy, like with reality, really no? Interesting with it, when I really felt like this. Just like a, a whole office was... full of toys and expensive trainers and just 
doing the same thing again and again every year, like reselling hype and toys, hype and toys, hype and toys to kids. Like, oh god, when this bubble bursts, I'll be so happy. Just go back to the essence of it, man. This is this is is this fun for anyone? Is this fun? Really? You're getting toyed around with these shoes. Like, I made this amazing dunk shoe. Amazing, yeah. Well, not really amazing. I just took the dunk that I made last year and I just flipped the colors again, and then now it represents China and uh, and the U. Like, what? Okay, cool. Uh, me wanting to sort of respect where I come from and then the panda being like the, the sort of like unofficial mascot of China, the pigeon being the unofficial mascot of New York City, you know, the panda owning the jungle, the pigeon owning like the urban jungle. It just made sense for the, these two animals that should never come together to come together. On That's reverse. If ever there was reverse rationalization, it there good. is. I mean, I'm and still that kid on. in sixth grade who is still like carefully lacing up shoes and dreaming of the day I get to go to Beaverton, you know, see what it's like in the Wizard of Oz. So to be able to still have that sort of like crazy feeling inside my soul when I see a pair of shoes, it's still uh, unbelievable. But when you see a dunk that you already made time ago, and I go, just, come on, man, this isn't a, ah, Jesus Christ, anyway, I can't be too that I get to But yeah, anyway, my logo. I think that's probably enough. I don't want to watch too much more of this video. Um, I'm not sure when it's going to come out. The shoe's coming out soon. I guess if you, if you care about that sort of stuff, then probably keep your eye out, eye, out, eye out for it. For me, could give a fucking Scooby-Doo. Like I said, if, if they were made you know, with the intention of making sure sneakerheads actually buy them and not kind of causing virality and making sure there's riots on the streets and people get in a fights and stuff and videos go up on fucking Worldstar and, you know, marketing teams, you know, on the low can kind of like celebrate that. Wow, look at this guerrilla marketing thing we've done with no, with no ad spend or blah, blah, blah. Fuck off. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not involved in it. But again, I wish him all the best. I hope the shoe blows up and it does as well as it needs to be done and you can call it parlay this other things. But I want to see more new stuff. Give us something interesting. Give us something fresh, man. Don't don't always come back with the same old stuff is rehashing it maybe there's other stuff he's done that i've not been aware of but the things that always garner attention on in jeff staples realm is always a pigeon 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 i went to the store read space back in the day it was a fucking interesting store to go into right cool interesting space like great things in there like build from that i don't know whatever i'm not one to tell anyone what to do in their, their career who am i to say that but come on man offer something more than just rehashing a fucking sb dunks like and getting a boner over it like come on really God damn it. God damn. God damn, god damn, god damn. Um, but in other news of good shoes I saw actually, shoes that I thought were interesting, that kind of again, um, that I didn't think would be would be interesting. There's this weird collaboration with the Sue Surgeon that doesn't look fucking shit, right? The shoe surgeon guy, I've never really been a fan of, right? Because obviously most of the shoes you always see from him are from people that want Jordan 1s done in fucking luxe materials, whether they be um, snake skin or gator skin or whatever else skin that they want to do, right? That's all the, the kind of rage was at, the, at, at that time, right? Getting a sneaker and making it as expensive as they can. Just fucking, you know, uh, sort of like luxury by numbers sort of thing, right? But I, I'm, not really, I'm, I'm not really a fan of that. But what I've seen recently is this collaboration I saw on Heist Nobody that looks fucking cool. And it's a collaboration with Sue Surgeon and a guy called Austin Scotty. I'm assuming it works for Kiff, right? Kiff's Austin Scotty reveals a bespoke Air Jordan 1 in collaboration with a Sue Surgeon, which looks fucking sick. So he's, again, I think he's taken a, a nod from the kind of Co JP um air force ones and and air maxes with a sort of like jeweled swoosh and the kind of mini swoosh on the front and he's created this absolutely incredible jordan one um model that looks so so good something i'm assuming nike or jordan brand should be taking a look on so if all the beaverton stuff were flipping losing their rag over seeing a rejected sample of a dunk that they did before right they should be losing their rag over seeing something like this 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 is something to lose your rag over this looks fucking cool so again um nice like what is that like an off-white upper like a cream upper this looks amazing overall this looks so 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 cool so you've got like a, a bejeweled swoosh a bejeweled swoosh on the side like a mini swoosh it's not swoosh that goes all the way to the back like normal jordans do you've got a mini swoosh on the front of the toe box and again just all done in really nice materials um is that kind of tumbled leather at the back that i'm not too sure but it just looks it looks fucking beautiful it looks beautiful that's it, it just looks beautiful the presentation looks good everything about it looks good and this is this is why i think shoe surgeon is really the master he could be a master of i think there's just taking luxury materials and placing them onto shoes or stitch whatever how he does it isn't that interesting but i think this is really this really shows off his craftsmanship because i'm not sure what base model they started with or how they went about doing this but this looks fucking sick so again um, it's a one-off edition model i think he did for this guy austin keith what's his name austin scotty um someone from keith here so it's a sale kind of colorway again look at that just look how cool that looks man it looks so beautiful 
I'd buy that at an instant that came out of the shop. Absolute instant. I'm assuming that's sort of like, is that tumbled leather? Yeah, there we go, yeah. So the custom pair is a sale colorway with tumbled leather upper and Air Jordan 1's first ever Jew swoosh. There's also a mini swoosh in Brooklyn toe. It's quite explained the reason I wanted to design it to speak for itself and I wanted it to wear them all the damn time. Yeah, this is definitely a shoe to wear all the damn time. And I really love the whole, like, um, there's a lot of people doing it now with the um, sort of like a exp well, exposed, but uh, pure white or sail or off-white midsole because it catches a lot of dirt and it obviously weathers the shoe more. It makes it look a bit more worn in. Taking inspiration, I think the person that kind of started that was Tom Sachs with the Mars Yard one that I have. It kind of picks up dirt really well, uh, really quickly, sorry. So obviously you can't really keep it pristine and clean and you want to kind of go against the whole sneaker head thing being a new york kind of um studio he knows that most sneakerheads in new york kind of want their shoe to be pristine they don't like creases in the front of the toe box they walk a particular way so to kind of go away from that making sure the sole is off white to catch his dirt and it kind of really kind of roughs it up a little bit i love that that all, uh, that approach i'm assuming they kind of did the same sort of thing with a sale colorway that'll look great once it's kind of worn in and beaten a bit actually this might look quite cool with the actual clear sole but again, like I said, I think as it is, looks fucking incredible. I wouldn't change the absolute thing about it. So sail the whole way through from upper, mid to low. No contrasting laces or anything. A nice bejeweled swoosh on the side. Oh, fuck me. Imagine if Jordan actually took that design and decided to extend the bejeweled swoosh all the way around. That would look fucking sick too. It looks incredible. Again, um, amazing, amazing collaboration that just I saw pop up. That, wasn't, that I wasn't really expecting because I wasn't really, no, never really been a fan of Sue Surgeon's work. But this... This is a fucking smasher. So yeah, big up Sue Surgeon and big up um, the Austin Scotty dude from Kiff for designing those. They look fucking incredible. Anyway, that is um, one hour actually of the Action Zinger podcast. That's 139, ep episode number 139 actually with me, Jose Agostino. One hour, one hour of blabbering blabbering into the microphone and here we are again i'll be back hopefully i think tomorrow if not this will be the end of the week for me um tomorrow depends on the time that i wake up to go to gym that's all my luck if i can squeeze the quick one i'll do it then if not i'll see you guys again next week but if i don't um, have a good weekend enjoy yourself and with that malarkey have a good time uh, make sure you don't get too crazy in that and i'll see you guys again on the other side for another episode of the agassino zinger show peace